welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine. That's Emily. It's still the off season. I still don't know what to do with myself. Um, but we're here and we are back with another F101 episode. If you are new to our F101 episodes, it is our educational series uh, doing deep dives into aspects of the sport. And today we are here to talk about the Braun documentary. We are. We are. After I finally was able to watch it <laughs> in Argentina. Oh, God bless VPNs. But yes, we are here to talk about the Braun, the Impossible Formula One story. Um, I watched it on Hulu. I think it's also available on Disney Plus. It's probably also available on Star Plus or Apple TV, depending on where you are. Um, distribution rights and everything. But I, going to be honest, did not know a ton about the backstory of Braun. I knew... Like, they were a new team. They won the first year that they were a team, which is they're still the only team to do that. So I knew it just from that piece of it. I know who Button was, but I didn't know, like, the full backstory of the entire team. So this, to me, was really fun to watch um, for the podcast. Yeah, I mean, I knew even less than that going into this. I, I know that um, it was about Button winning in 2009. My dad told me to watch it and it was really good. And that's what I came into with this. And I totally did not get anything that I expected out of it in a good way. Um, and if you have a spare four hours and you're new to Formula One or you want to relive the 2009 season, I definitely think you should watch this documentary because it just it was really, really well done. And it even just gives a lot of history of, like, some of the teams and things that, like, the FIA and F1 went through in that season. And, you know, 20, 2008, 2009, kind of the years that it covers. Um, it was super in interesting just to also get more background, see the drivers that were driving at the time. And just, you know, it's off season. We need something to watch. So, yeah. it, uh, it to me, it was, it was a really, really well done. And I can't say enough. Keanu Reeves <laughs> is the is like the host of this. So he does some interviews and he does some like, I don't know, voice clips. I don't know why he was there, to be honest with you, though. It to me felt like it could have been very documentary style, just interviews. But you like threw him into interview. I don't know. He did a good job, but um, it was just interesting. <laughs> I think it was definitely one of those, hey, I'm a very famous actor and I have this very, you know, interest in Formula One and I want to do this thing. And they're like, sure, you're doing the John Wick movies. You're a huge name to help, um, you know, promote the sport. Why not? And and like you said, he he did a really good job. And I think that you can tell that he like did the research himself for the questions that he was asking in these interviews. And it wasn't like somebody just feeding to him things to talk about. Yeah, no, I just... Part of me was like, why is he there? And then I'm like, I feel like they had this documentary set and they're like, no one's going to buy it. Let's throw a celebrity in there to host. Who kind of likes F1? <laughs> Keanu Reeves. The job is yours. <laughs> I don't know. It just seems random to me. But maybe I don't know everything. I mean, obviously, I don't know everything. But uh, but yeah, but he did do a really good job. Yeah, it was, he, he had, he, he, you just, you see how much fun he's having when, you know, they were doing interviews in, in studio, or if they were doing interviews at, you know, people's houses or on track, like he was having the time of his life. He was, it was really, yeah, he like was just staring so intently and like they would just pan to him at one point and he's just like, yes, like, just like, I don't know. It was funny. So yeah. comedic relief, at least for me, but. Yeah. Yeah. But like even him, you know, when they with his, when they were talking and no spoilers, but when they were talking about the appeal um, that Braun had to go through to basically certify that the car was legal during the season, like you see him going through the, you know, the paperwork and it's this like big stack of paperwork of, you know, the lawsuit and the, the case and everything that was going on. And he's like actually interested in the stuff in front of him. Yeah. Or it could just be for camera. You never know. He's yeah. a very good actor. We know this. <laughs> no, but yeah, it, he he did a really good job. So. Yeah. So to to take things back a little bit, this all the the way Braun came to exist as a Formula One team all started back in two thousand eight during the global financial crisis. I was eighteen. I was going off to college. I had no concept of things like the economy. 
I think I was, I was probably 15, 15, 14. We had like just moved to Texas and Texas like felt no effects of the crash or anything. We left California because things were getting bad. And we moved to Texas where like everything was normal. I think, I don't know, at the time oil was so high that Texas just kind of like remained it's fine, constant. But it was, I mean, I learned about it in school and I, we talk about it all the time, but I, we didn't really feel it where I was, so. Yeah, I mean, I was in California, but I, my family was in the toilet paper business and you still need toilet paper even when the economy's in the toilet, so to speak. So that that could have been it. I mean, I, we really had, we had, I had no concept of it, but what it did do is Honda, which was the F1 team at the time, which took over um, British American racing, also known as BAR, which was Tyrell racing, um, because the economy was so bad, especially in like the consumer car market, um, they just couldn't afford to stay in motor racing when they were trying to keep things in their own country, you know, in back in, in Japan, which was one of the, you know, one of the other worst hit countries during this this global depression so they couldn't just be like we have this company in the uk that races motorsport and is very expensive like they just couldn't justify i was it. gonna say there's a lot of money that we throw at it uh yeah not yeah. not a financial responsible move to keep it so they did um step away from formula one and exit formula one and I think they 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 they, ve- they felt pretty bad about it. Like I I don't think that they wanted to do it. Um, one of the the funny moments w- from the documentary is when um when Ross Braun and Nick Fry found out that they were stepping away, um, and they were just gonna shutter the company like immediately. And they're sitting there like that's against the rules. You can't do you that. Can't that's do that. not legal. And I'm like rules legality. I mean I know that they're supposed to matter, but they don't. Um, but I, I think what, what Braun and, and Fry and the, the management consortium was able to do to, you know, help save those jobs for, for that time was, was very impressive, especially considering everything that had been going on back then. Yeah. And they, I mean, you'll watch it and it's, they don't get, they don't save every job, but they do save a lot of people's jobs and they kind of saved the team from just shuttering, like Catherine said, um, which is against the rules. So <laughs> they would have had to figure out a way, you know, but they were talking about how they they have, I don't know, a thousand plus people working for this team. And then all of a sudden you, you tell a thousand people they no longer have a job like overnight. Um, you just During the holidays. During the holidays. Yeah. You just can't do that. So um well, I mean, you can, and I think, you know, based on everything that, that you know, ec- economically what was going through, I think that Japan, absolutely, Hondo in Japan would have gotten away with it, but they were able to convince Japan to keep things up and running for three months while they figured, you know, sponsorship, a buyout, uh, you know, it's getting getting someone in there. Um, I, I, you know, kind of wonder, like they, they said that there were some people who were interested that were like really sketchy people. So I'm like, what if they like what if this company bought this racing team from um honda and basically turned it into like some money laundering scheme i just thought that that would have been really funny yeah if if they didn't come up with the sponsors that they did or you know come up with the plan that they did um who knows where this team would be at this point in time cuz this yeah. team like not a spoiler cuz we all know the history but Braun turned into Mercedes. And so like if things, you know, went a different way, you never know what this team would have been or what could have gone on. So Yeah. I mean, what team would Lewis had won his seven world championships with if he wasn't with Mercedes? Obviously the answer is McLaren, but that's an entirely yeah, different story. But. Yeah. Um, and then I love how when they were trying to figure out like marketing and, and branding, like what the team name was that Braun's wife was like, do we really have to call it Braun? Really? really? Yeah. Because it's yeah, because it, Ross Braun just named it after himself, essentially. <laughs> yeah. Good for him, man. Have, a, yeah. have an F1 team named after you. Yeah. Um, Especially yeah, coming from Ferrari and everything that he had done with them. And then like, you know, 
for, I don't think Ferrari was like the biggest fan of of what he did and and how he he stayed with the sport. You know, but the was like, I was okay with him leaving Ferrari because he told me he wanted to go fishing. <laughs> yeah, and then he and did not. A year later, he's like his name is the name of the new team, and I'm yeah. just like that seems like a big fuck you to Ferrari, but. It's also, I think, it was just a good opportunity. And if you have good opportunities like that come across your desk, like you have to just jump at it. So, yeah. And that said, whatever issues the Ferrari chairman and Ferrari itself had had, all of Formula One, all of the teams really came together to keep, you know, during the transition, Honda slash Braun, you know, on the grid in. I think a pretty rare show of unified support for the teams. Like we don't see it all that often, you know, teams are really just butting heads. Um, And I think it it really reminded me of, you know, over these last couple of weeks, the Formula One teams now coming together to support Susie and Toto Wolf after that whole FIA investigation nonsense that we're still getting notifications about how, you know, F1 teams are offended on their behalf. Yeah. Um. Yeah, no, it is super rare because normally we see, even if there is an issue, you see people taking sides and you don't see a united front. So, um, yeah, it was good to see. And especially, we'll go into it a little bit later, but like the FOTA FIA thing. And um, this season was probably, again, I didn't watch the entire season, just watching the documentary. 2009 might be a good, interesting season to watch after watching this. Hmm. Um, But it seems like, this is the season where everyone was working together more so than working against each other, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And we, we let's just dive right into to FOTA, which is the Formula One Teams Association. And um, this was a, a really interesting time. And, and, you know, right now, the, you know, the, the, f- organization that's Formula One is a separate company from the FIA, but that, you know, for those of you who don't know, wasn't always true. And at this time of the documentary, Formula One was basically the same thing as the FIA. And it was Bernie Eccleston and Max Mosley were the dynamic duo. Bernie Eccleston was in charge of Formula One. Max Mosley was FIA president. Um, And they they were in charge. They were holding all the purse strings. They were also getting all of the money. And it was very much, um, you know, Eccleston says in, in the documentary, like he likes dictators. And, and it was very, you know, between him and Mosley, it was very dictator-like back then, um, which led to the creation of the Formula One Teams Association. Yeah, Bernie bothered me, not going to lie. Just like yeah. seeing old footage of him and hearing his like lack of answers in the interviews, not a huge fan. Yeah, I understand that that Bernie is is a, a very complicated and polarizing figure in the sport, um, and you know he he did a lot of good, but he also did a lot of not so good um, to to be diplomatic about it, I guess, if, if I, if I want to go that way. Um, but you know, between him and, and Max Mosley, I think that, you know, he, Max Mosley was, was kind of in charge of the FIA when they, when the words, Catherine, when Braun was appealing the decision to, to keep the, their car legal after the first couple of races, because a couple other teams protested, um, something called a double diffuser, which the documentary will fill you in on all the the physics about that, which really set the car apart, you know, going into the first few races of the 2009 season. Um, but Max Mosley was really the one who was like, this looks like it's going to cause some chaos in the sport. So we're going to call it legal, whether it's legal or not. Yeah. It, yeah. I didn't, I didn't like any of these characters mm-hmm. and I'm, you know, not like we have much better characters. <laughs> No, I mean, it was, it, it, it's <laughs> but. Michael Massey, um, who was the, the race director in 20, uh, 2021, among other years, when he notably made the decision that led to Max Verstappen winning the 2021 20, uh, World Championship. Um, he really took a page out of Max Mosley's book, if, if you want to call it that, for, you know, making things exciting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. but <laughs> I, I think, you know, 2009, 2010, you know, the Formula One teams were were at a, a high risk of just leaving the FIA and, and creating their own motorsport, 
Motorsport Association, their own, you know, set of races, their own set of sponsorships, um, which, you know, taking the crown jewel of motorsport away from the FIA would have been absolutely drastic, completely detrimental. Um, I don't know how well it would have gone had had they gone through with it. Um, But, you know, Bernie Eccleston, he, you know, put some people in a corner and he, he really, um, you know, he did what he could to, to maintain the, the, you know, the FIA, but had the team principals and the teams not created FOTA, I don't think that they would have gotten the new Concord agreement, the new contract um, that gave the teams more power and more money. And I think, you know, Bernie wasn't happy about it, but it is also one of the bigger factors that leads to the Formula One that we see today in 2023. Yeah, I know. And I was thinking about this, like watching it the entire time. Like if the lawyers at Braun didn't put in the one small piece of the contract to where because Bernie announced it early, he broke confidentiality um so that was null and void so they were able to kind of you know join up with all the other teams part of me wonders like what would have happened if they didn't throw that piece in there and if they would have had to you know side with bernie rather than join all the teams and photo like i i wonder what truly would have happened if it would have been just like a colossal breakdown or if oh it would have been yeah and because it just because of one team so having that united front um like you said, gives us the Formula One FIA that we have today um, versus in 2009. And also the entire time I was thinking about it, they they showed like the legal counsel woman. I can't remember her name for Braun. That woman deserves so much recognition. Oh, yeah. So much money for everything that she's done for this sport just by throwing in one clause of a contract. Um, Gotta love, gotta love lawyers, but... um, yeah. yeah, no, I was well, thinking about the entire time. Yeah, because the the reason why they had to, to make this agreement with Bernie while also si- wanting to side with FOTA was they needed money. They, yeah. they you know, they didn't have a budget. They were working on probably significantly less money than Haas made before the MoneyGram contract. Um, and they, they basically, they got $100 million from um honda as part of the management takeover agreement but they still had to let a lot of people go and like their fuel guy was one of the guys that they let go because this was back when you could refuel cars mid-race and after the first couple of races they realized that their pit stops were really really bad um usually they're like eight seconds at the time and they were closer to like 11 12 13 um so they basically had a fuel guy who was working as a plumber come in on his weekends so that they could have a fuel guy for races yeah they had no money so they had to they had to make this agreement to get some money out of of bernie and the fia that they were that that bernie was basically holding hostage right um, the whole thing too was that it was a new team so they weren't entitled to any of the money from the team last season because last season they were honda this season they're braun essentially the same people same team just a different name yeah and bernie pretty much said oh well you're not entitled to any of the money that honda would have had so that's a huge chunk of money that they thought they had coming in as well going towards their budget that they just didn't um and so that's also why they had to deal with bernie because he was like kevin said holding this money hostage yeah i mean they they even were were at the point where like dirty oh he's playing very very dirty and 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 like he doesn't remember anything none of it none of this it's it's very revisionist history but he's also like eight eighty zillion years old and he's 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 given the crown quite a bit of money from some uh, investments that his taxes got messed up on, but that's that's really the the news that we've got out of of Bernie Eccleston. Sometimes you'll see him on on Martin Brundle's grid walk, and yeah, he's he's that guy. Yeah. Anyways, also speaking of Martin, he looked so pulled together and was so good in this documentary. Right. I was like, not that I don't think he's impressive. He has a his like a ton of history in f1 he was a driver you know he's a commentator now but just seeing him like hustle people on the grid walk i forget that he's actually very very knowledgeable and like good at this 
Not that I don't forget. I know he is, but it was just interesting to see him in a different light. And I really enjoyed a lot, all of his commentary around, you know, this, um, these events. Yeah, I think that the the Formula One YouTube channel has a video that basically calls him one of the greatest Formula One drivers to have never won a race. Um, and I, I think that, you know, I, I keep forgetting that he's been around the sport for so long. Like I, you know, spoiler alert, one of the other um, notable things that we're going to be talking about in F101 is the 2005 United States Grand Prix. And Martin Brundle is up there in the commentary box. Like he's been doing this forever Ever. and he's yeah. so knowledgeable about this and he's just so good at what he does. Um, and his insights are just, it's fantastic to, to, you know, still have that around the sport. Yeah. And as much as I hate him just because of the season, Christian Horner was actually also very entertaining to watch and listen to. Oh so yeah. Very, like I love his sense of humor and like his dryness He's just very British, but um, I thought he gave a really interesting perspective. Catherine and I were talking, I think he's the only principal to be around during this brawn thing and now. So he has a really interesting perspective and, and he provided that and gave it, you know, a lot of commentary around what the teams were thinking, the team principals were thinking, what they, what was going on. Um and especially with the the double diffuser because he was just came out and said it like the car was illegal we know it's illegal it it it, this was the wrong call and just giving you know commentary commentary around that and also like talking about when they said that it was okay just like adrian newey just like locking himself in his office and having to talk about that and he's like he actually missed a race just so he could work on trying the new double diffuser for red bull that was one of my favorite moments from the documentary. Yeah. And like, I think it was great that I, I, I honestly think like, obviously the, the battle for the 2009 championship was between Braun and Red Bull. Um, but they really didn't portray Red Bull as like the villain of, of the story that I think no. that they really pushed Ferrari and more the Ferrari chairman at the time. Like he was really the most villainous, so to speak, other than like Bernie and Max Mosley. But I think Ferrari was also the most vocal about mm-hmm. what, on i don't think red bull was sitting there complaining and like going to every news media outlet and you know giving their full life story about how upset they are but i think ferrari did and so i think that's why they were you know so focused on the ferrari of it all also because braun left ferrari there's ties there there's you know bad blood whatever but to me, it seemed like Red Bull was just like, okay, we have to make a better car. And I yeah, think that's they, they, their approach and their their philosophy always is, we'll just make a better car. Yeah, and I think one of the other funnier parts that, that also comes to this is like, you know, they came together in the in the in the winter in the off season to to keep Braun or to keep Honda on the grid in some way. You know, they all came together, and then Braun has the audacity to be good and win the first two races and and win what six of the first seven. Yeah. Like, and everybody's like, okay, we wanted to keep you around, but we didn't expect you to be good. We expected you to be Honda. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and it was what one like low level engineer who was just reading through all of the require requirements and regulations. And was like, well, I think we can do something different here. Yeah. Um, So it just takes one person to, you know, change a whole season. Um, Yeah. I personally loved just randomly seeing our man, James Voles. Yeah. Like it did not even cross my mind that he was at, Braun, even though I know like he was at Mercedes forever, naturally he would have probably been there during this whole Braun time. But um, seeing him and having him talk was just so great because he was chief strategist yeah. at the time um, for Braun. And it's just like crazy how this sport is so small. It's the same people kind of like rotating in and out. And it's it's not a very big world. Like everyone's no. connected. Yeah, I I remember like they showed an old clip from I think it was like preseason or something, and it was like it showed Vows from the back, and I'm like, 
is that Jim Spells? And yeah. then he came in for the inner, and then they cut to his interview. And it was like, oh my God, that's James Vowles. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, that explains why Braun did well. He was their strategist. Like he, that's, that's what James does. Um, so it, and it was just, it was, it's always great to see him. The story of him admitting that the steering wheel for Button's car in Malaysia, which was red flag due to rain, was full of water. And had the race restarted like the car would not have started i think is is one of the greatest bits it, like like the they got so lucky that they just decided to red flag and, and end the race because yeah. you know they were in the lead and there was no way that car was going to be going because if you tipped it over water would come out of the innards <laughs> uh good old james yeah never never ceases to amaze me um but yeah I also forget like how long people have been around because like Adrian Newey I know he's been around but he was like very much super involved in the double diffuser at Red Bull and you have him like being super involved at Red Bull and Christian Horner even though Christian Horner looks like he's 12 because he looks so young well he was young when he took over Red Bull in 2005 like he he is very young in the grand scheme of his his career but also he looks young compared to how he looks now yeah and then I mean it's Lewis Hamilton at the beginning of his career and of course Alonzo's on track because Alonzo has been racing forever yeah um but it's cool because we uh, there was Massa and Schumacher was on the grid at the time, so it's just it's super. Uh, or was Schumacher still on or no? Um, I can never remember when he retired. But they, uh, they talked. Well, about he he retired and then un, un, unretired. So hold on. So maybe, but they did show like Schumacher around, and so it's just like this. Like I said, the sport's not very big. It's just no. It, it's it's people. really. It's really, really not. No, he he was off um, from he, – he raced in 2006 and then came back on in 2010. So he missed this okay, year. He missed that season. But Rubens Barrichello, his teammate for, for so many years, and we'll get to him in a bit, um, he he was on the grid. There, there are so many familiar names that are still around the sport now. Seb Vettel, Mark Weber, who is um, Oscar Piastri's manager, was driving for Red Bull. You've got um, – Jensen Button is still, you know, uh, he's doing media for Sky Sports these days. So a lot of people back then are still around now. And then, yeah. of course, there are others who, who aren't. <laughs> Which I think is so interesting compared to, like, any other sport. I feel like you don't have that same, like, close-knit, we're just rotating in and out all of our people type of mentality. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I feel like in any other professional setting, you don't have – all these familiar faces from what 14 15 years ago that are still very very big presence in the sport i don't know it's just it was my take i yeah i i totally agree and like they they didn't really you know they didn't talk a lot about like what happened in the in the 2009 season outside of the the braun versus red bull battle um but they they really show just how important things like car development throughout the season are when you can afford to develop your car. Yeah. Yeah. Them talking about how like we only had one car, like we had our two cars that we raced in. We didn't have the money to do anything else. And like everyone else was developing like five or six cars at the same time. So you can see like from the beginning of the documentary, they're killing it with this double diffuser and they are just beating everybody. And then once it is deemed that it's legal, everything's fine. And other teams start to develop it quickly and add it to their cars as well. They just start to slip off because they couldn't, they didn't have the budget to make any changes to the car or develop the car further for the season. Yeah. Their, their title sponsor was Virgin, which was Richard Branson, um, who also had kind of wanted to buy the team itself. But the the sponsorship deal that that they agreed to was not a lot of money. And because they were so busy working out, you know, other things, they didn't have like full time sponsors on the car for full season. So week to week, they were changing out the sponsor stickers on cars um so the the car would look completely different race to race and not because they were changing up the liveries like alfa romeo did yeah well and they their rubens only had a contract for four races 
Yeah. They, they didn't even have contracted drivers for the full season because they didn't they couldn't afford it. And so they had to like just make sure Rubens was, I don't know, gonna perform. And if not, they'd cut him and put someone else in the car that was probably cheaper. Yeah. Um, which is wild. Like hearing a driver only have a contract for four races is baffling, especially with all the contract stuff that we talk about now. Like that's insane. Yeah. And he was still at home in Brazil when they were doing like the shakedowns right before testing because he didn't have a contract until like the 11th hour um, because like he didn't know how it was going to work out. They didn't know if they were going to have a car that was going to be good. And then I loved how they they were like, our math says that we're two seconds faster than the grid. That has to be wrong. And then they were like, no, we're actually two seconds faster than the grid. Yeah. Double diffusers, man. Oh, yeah. Double diffusers greater than double DNFs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I also liked how they they really focused on just how important mindset is to success. Because that was one of the huge parts that Jensen Button really struggled with when every, all the cars were becoming as competitive as his car was. Like, he, he really had all of this pressure, you know, he, they went into Silverstone on a high and then he didn't win his home race. And then all of a sudden all these cars have caught up to him. So they, he really had to cling to his standings and the fact that he had all these points from the first part, you know, first third of the season um, to make it through to that last bit to ultimately clinch the title in Brazil. Yeah. That's a lot of like mental gymnastics you have to go through like I can't even imagine winning six of the first seven races and then all of a sudden just like you're confident like not winning a race like your his confidence had to have just plummeted the mental game is crazy yeah and then like how the Brazilian media was treating him um you Dude, know going that into that so weekend upsetting what it was it was really ridiculous and I like and it, it wasn't even like we like Ruben's better than you. It's just that, like, they just didn't. Well, I, th- I think a lot of it was that they they really liked Ruben's Barrichello, but you know more than. But I I do think that they redeemed themselves a little bit. Like he he didn't get the the same amount of negative reaction that Max Verstappen got in Austin this year, even though that was mostly due to the the governor of Texas and less about you know Max not liking Max. But anyway, um, there's still a little bit of that that parallel there, and it like I can't imagine how Jensen felt the night before the. Brazilian race and then him just waking up and saying you know what screw it I'm gonna kick butt today it's gonna be great and he did it well and I think it's interesting too and maybe I just missed this or maybe I'm just you know an emotional cancer but I feel like Rubens should have done something more as his teammate been like hey guys love the love thank you my fellow Brazilians however let's stop being so aggressively terrible to button like I think he could have helped with that piece of it especially like speaking out on his behalf and being like hey appreciate it love the love but like let's keep it positive I feel like drivers today are much better at that like when there's hate going towards a driver it's like hey like let's stop this we don't need this it's not needed in the sport but I just would think especially them going into Brazil trying to win the championship as a team as well. Like, yes, I know it's a team sport, but it's not. It's individual. But I feel like he could have just done more, like, to support his team and his teammate. Yeah. I mean, we don't know if he didn't do that because – you know, this is all just coming much, from yeah. the documentary. It might have happened. We weren't there in 2009. I was busy in college, and we just don't have to reflect on that time of my life. Um, but I think that Rubens Barrichello is one of my favorite – not on the grid, you know, legacy members of, of Formula One of all time. I he he's just like he's the quintessential number two driver. And like that that's his career. He's the the number two. He was the number two behind Michael Schumacher at Ferrari. He was the number two uh behind Jensen at Braun. Like he is the number two guy and that made him miserable. Well the entire time I'm watching this, I was like, Rubens Barrichello walked so that Valtteri Bottas could run. <laughs> because yeah. he, like, I mean, Valtteri was number two at Mercedes for how long? And Rubens was at Braun, which then turned into Mercedes. And it's just, like, this cycle. But, no, he truly is, like, 
I was like, this is Valtteri Bottas. This seems like Valtteri <laughs> Bottas. Is he? Yep, this is Valtteri Bottas. Um, but no, I thought he, he, and he's a good driver, which is really hard. And I feel like he, I liked him because he kind of went after the team and the media. And I'm like, oh, this guy's kind of spicy. Yeah. Um, but he never like truly came out outright and said like, oh, they're favoring Button over me and they're doing this. It's just like, no, I think we just had a really good display on how to lose a race. <laughs> yeah. And I, I so. do say I love um, at the European Grand Prix, which the fact that they're, they had they had a race back then that was called the European Grand Prix when there are, what, eight races in Europe. In Europe. I just thought that I, I just thought that like to specifically call one race the European Grand Prix was hilarious. But I loved the show when he did win that race of the entire pit lane congratulating him when he was when he was um, driving to um, to the podium at the end of the race and everyone was saluting him. It was the hundredth Brazilian driver win. Um, I think that was also when he was wearing the helmet um, for Felipe Massa. Massa. Yeah. And Massa had been very injured by a component that came off of Rubens's car. And I didn't realize in, you know, some of the, um, earlier episodes that we've done um, about Felipe Massa suing Formula One for 2008, I didn't realize that the cause of Massa's head injury was a component came off of his car and and hit him. And the fact that Massa still has the helmet and it's still covered in blood is just absolutely bananas to me, but that was also oh, really cool. That was probably one of my favorite parts of the documentary when he's talking to Keanu and he's like, I have the helmet, you want to see? And then he's like, there's still blood on it. Be careful. We didn't yeah. touch it. <laughs> he was like way animated about it, like talking about it. He was like, yeah. Uh, well, and after his accident, they made different helmets. Yeah. Yeah. They, they reinforced that portion of, of the helmet right above the visor. Um, so if a giant metal spring flies off car and hits you in the head, you're going to be fine. Um, but like it really goes to show you just how conscientious motorsport is of safety year after year. Obviously we saw the safety improvements that they've made um, with the inclusion of the halo, um, which was reviled in the years before it, before it, it came al along and which I think is hilarious in, in hindsight. And then, you know, when Roman Grosjean's car exploded and cut in half, like all of the extra safety that they they've done. So they're very conscientious of safety, you know, and well, the last thing anyone wants is... changes too, because mm -hmm. they're they're they changed the regulations to make sure that the cars, one, are getting safer and safer, and two, are not overdeveloped to where they're going so so fast and pulling so many G's that if there is an accident, it you know it could take someone's life. So they do yeah. these regulations to keep cars within a certain, let's say you know range of operation for safety. Right. Not everyone likes them, but I just, I think back to like, how could they have been driving without a halo? How? Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. It, for, for people who have only seen live Formula One races with the halo, the fact that it's not on, you know, cars before 2017 is just really kind of crazy to me. Um, That's the crazy part that it took until like 2017 for them to put the halo on. Yeah. And like there, the, the first race of 2016, um, Fernando Alonso goes flying in Australia. His car like goes, goes over and over like twice. He, I think had a collapsed lung after it from, from the injury, his car ended up upside down. He had to be helped out. Like, and, and the fact that you have Joe Guan Yu at Silverstone, um, I know. And it, last year, uh, in 2022, where he ended up between the fence separating the track from the fans and a bunch of, you know, and, and the, the tire barrier, and he's fine because of, the, like, it's it's absolutely insane that, like, that that is not, had not been a thing. Yeah, sometimes, like, people are like, oh, it's exciting. There was a big crash. It's, like, cool to watch or whatever. But, like, these aren't stunt doubles. This isn't a under control situation in a movie these are yeah. actually people's lives and so big crashes like that I remember Joe Guan Yu's crash watching it live like just holding my breath because there was no no news and just watching George Russell like run across the track to and I was just like oh wow like this is 
this is big this is bad but yeah if yeah. there wasn't a halo there who knows what it would have happened so yeah and i i did not watch the the only bits of silverstone um 2022 i've watched are from drive to survive i have not watched that race because of reasons that i do not want to get into um but it's it really goes to show you just like how dangerous the sport is and you can only do so much like nobody expects a car to wedge itself between a fence and a tire barrier no, no. we should do a whole f101 on uh safety i will add that to our list we've got a we've got a pretty add extensive list, list of, of <laughs> f101 episodes we're going to be doing we have um, a lot of um off season though so <laughs> get ready yeah um yeah i and also you know I, I, while I was watching the documentary, I was really curious to see what the, what the, like, what the points would be um, if this was on, you know, today's scale. Back then, it was, it was 10 to 1 for the top eight um, with 10 points for the winner. And they did not award a, a point for fastest lap. So I, I, I mathed it out. And if they were given today's points, and obviously this is, you know, not a complete comparison because, you know, they didn't have sprint races back in 2009, which is, really kind of nice for them a time. <laughs> yeah but um button ended up with the equivalent of 241 and a half points sub vettel who was in p2 in the championship had 206 and rubens barrichello had 196 equivalent whereas as a team braun had 447 and a half points as a constructor and red bull was behind them at 380 so it, it really shows you what the you know, the equivalent gaps are, um, because if you look at the point standings for 2009 from then, um, I think there's like nine points between Vettel and Button um, overall. But if you expand it to today's numbers, you really see like how beneficial those six of those first six of seven wins were for Button at the start of the season. Um, then, yeah. you know, and that really that cushion really helped him in that second half where we, we did say that he didn't do as well. And, you know, there were a lot of other cars that developed and there were a lot of other people on the podium that were not in the race for the championship toward the latter half of the season, which also really helped Button maintain that championship race going, you know, going into that that second half. Yeah, no, it's interesting to see the comparison. I can't believe you figured out the math. Good for you. I That's had the time. <laughs> I had the time in a spreadsheet. Little math. Little math. I'm a statistician. It's what I do. I know. I love it. I love it. No, but it just, like, the whole thing watching it really made you, th like, makes me think how far the sport has come and, like, how different it is and how much it's changed in just 14, 15 years. Yeah. Like, mostly around safety, obviously, but the regulations, the cars have changed so much. We don't refuel cars anymore. Mm -hmm. um you know during the the races so pit stops are you know 1.8 seconds versus 11 seconds um so it's just interesting and it's a question i think we've already kind of brought up but also you know what if braun like didn't have this amazing season would you have had a huge name like mercedes and patronas come in and take over a team like i don't who think would so. this team would who would be this team where would Lewis Hamilton would he would have stayed at McLaren? What would have Button done if he left the team? Like, there's just Braun had to win so that Mercedes could take over um, and come in with getting the sponsorship from Patronus. And so, like, if all of this these perfect things didn't happen, like, it's I feel like the landscape of F1 would have been drastically different from 2010 on. Oh, ab absolutely. It would have been it would have been very interesting to see um, and potentially just a lot more Red Bull domination. Oh, I'm Red Bull domination. well, I'm just saying because 20 the, the season that followed was the first of Vettel's four consecutive titles. I know. Yeah, I know. Anyway, on that note, we're going on winter vacation. We are. Yeah. Are you, are you doing anything fun, Catherine, for uh, uh, winter? No. Break? No, I'm not. I, I will be I will be working on figuring out what I want 2024 to look like outside of podcasting. Um, hey, that's manifesting is fun. I know. Yeah. So I'm I'm going to be working on that. I know that you are going to be going on some great adventures. I will be. I'm going to um, going back to Brazil. I'm going to the Amazon. 
for some days. And then I'm also going to be crossing the Andes Mountains from Argentina to Chile on horseback. <laughs> so, you know, your typical uh, winter vacation. So never, never a dull moment living in South America. I have to make it count. I'm almost done. Absolutely. 100% agree. Yeah. So, so I will be doing that. I will be doing some dog sitting. Hopefully I don't get smacked in the face by another overexcited puppy um, and, and have to wear my glasses for, for three days while my eye heals up. Um, but so we, we will not be posting episodes until probably sometime in January, um, where we will be diving into a few more F101s before we go into preseason for 2024. Get those liveries ready. I'm so Get excited. those ready. Um, delivery update and everything like that. But yeah, like Catherine said, we are taking some time off. Well-deserved break. Um, and we will be back in the new year. So... That's been it for the podcast and our F101 recap of the Braun uh, documentary on Hulu and Disney+. Thanks for going off track with us, guys.